Good evening, everyone. I'm Louise Mirror, New York Historical Society's president and CEO, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to tonight's virtual program, Driving While Black, Race, Space, and Mobility in America. Tonight's program is presented as a part of our Bernard and Irene Schwartz Distinguished Speakers Series, which is the heart of our public programs. Just before I introduce our speakers, I want to recognize and thank New York Historical Trustees who are joining us this evening. First and foremost, our outstanding chair of our Board of Trustees, Pam Schaffler, the chair of our executive committee, Richard Reese, and trustees, Jean Reed, David Zelaznik, and tonight's moderator, Rick Burns. I'd also like to thank members of our Chairman's Council, we are so very grateful to each and every one of you for your encouragement and support, especially at this challenging time. Now then, we are pleased indeed to welcome Gretchen Soren to our virtual stage. Dr. Soren is Director and Distinguished Service Professor at the Cooperstown Graduate Program, a training program at the State University of New York College at Oneonta. Dr. Soren has more than 30 years of experience in the museum profession, working at more than 250 museums and curating exhibitions for the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service, the Jewish Museum in New York, the Adirondack Museum, and many more. She's also the author of the book, Driving While Black, African-American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights. We're also delighted to welcome Craig Stephen Wilder to our virtual stage. Dr. Wilder is Barton L. Weller Professor of History at MIT and a distinguished fellow at the Bard Prison Initiative. He's a historian of American institutions and ideas and has advised and appeared in num numerous historical documentaries, including Rick Burns, New York, A Documentary History. Dr. Wilder is the author of numerous books, including Ebony and Ivory, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities. And he's directed or advised exhibits at many regional and national museums. I myself had the honor of working together with Dr. Wilder on a New York Historical's 2005 exhibition, Slavery in New York. Joining us as moderator this evening is our own New York Historical Trustee, Rick Burns. Mr. Burns has produced, directed, and written historical documentaries for public television since 1990, when he and his brother Ken Burns produced The Civil War. From there, he went on to found Steeplechase Films and produced numerous films, garnering multiple Emmy Awards, DuPont Columbia Awards, and George Foster Peabody Awards. Dr. Soren and Mr. Burns join us tonight as co-writers and co-directors of the PBS documentary, Driving While Black, Race, Space, and Mobility in America. Tonight's program will last about an hour, including time for questions and answers. Your questions can be submitted via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. In the interest of simplicity, we've disabled the chat function tonight, so please do remember to use the Q&A our speakers will get to as many questions as time allows. Just before I turn over our virtual stage to our speakers this evening, we are pleased to share with you a trailer from the documentary, Driving While Black. The runtime is approximately two minutes and our speakers will join us upon its conclusion. Thank you. General Motors is a proud sponsor of Driving While Black. Driving While Black, Race, Space, and Mobility in America was made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Exploring the Human Endeavor, the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the 1772 Foundation, the Artemis Rising Foundation, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Mobility is essential to freedom. It's difficult to overstate the importance of the road and the car in American life. What it means to be American is to take to the road. To control your own destiny. Discovery. Freedom. Could I uh, see some ID, please? 
the notion of driving while black reminds us that that's not available to all Americans. Living while black, sleeping while black, eating while black, moving while black. That goes all the way back to day one. The power to choose, to be able to move freely in space. We live in a country where it's never been everybody's right. If you're an African American and you can afford a car, it provides a powerful alternative. What the automobile allows is personal freedom. I think the automobile it allows us to understand the way that African Americans have moved forward in this country and the way that African Americans have been pushed back. For African Americans, trips across country are not adventures. They can often be trials. With a car full of your family whom you love, and your wife is saying, we gotta stop for the night, and what do you do? So that's where the Green Book was indispensable, to give you some way to find a place where you could get some rest, get something to eat without being violated. Once they were inside this building, nobody was gonna worry them. People are not going to let themselves be paved over. They will insist that their voices are heard. This officer is unlocking my car. There are still so many dangers. African Americans are feeling a similar fear as their grandparents felt. That's how y'all treat black people, huh? We have to engage history with a kind of brutal honesty. And until we get to a place in which we actually are trying to live up to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for every human being who is in our society, then we're not there yet. Hi, good evening. Um, I wanted to thank the New York Historical Society, uh, Louise Mirror and Pam Schaffler, and all my fellow trustees so much for um, hosting us tonight virtually. It's great to be there with you almost. Um, and so, so proud and so grateful that we can be here tonight to talk about this particular film and this particular story. Um, I, you know, General Motors, uh, really went, went the full nine yards to sponsor the film and to make it possible for us to um, rebroadcast it or be rebroadcast tomorrow night. So we're very, very grateful to them, as to our other sponsors, um, Elizabeth Alexander at the Mellon Foundation, um, in, in many ways, but also a whole host of, of funders without whom we wouldn't be here. And of course, my colleagues, um, Amir Lewis, who edited and produced the film, Emily File, who produced the film, um, so thank you to all. Um, the, I think I'm most grateful that Craig Wilder and Gretchen Soaring are here. I've known you two for 30 years, and it's been one of the joys of my professional life to have the work that I do um, engage the work that you do, and you've brought a depth to it and a meaning to it and a, and a humanity to it, which has been extraordinary. So for 30 years of you know, work one way or the other. Um, thank you so much to you both and for being here tonight. Um, you know, Gretchen, um, you came to me five years ago uh, to start a film project about this subject. Um, not initially called Driving While Black, but pretty soon called Driving While Black. And I was wondering if, you know, in a sense, the ball began with you um, and how, did things begin for you? What's the, what's the origin of this journey for you? Not just the film journey, but the exploration into this, into this history. Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, I, I started out because a colleague of mine, a historian who teaches at, at Bard, uh, gave me the cover for the Green Book. And she said, have you ever heard of this thing? This was about 20 years ago. And I had not heard of it at that point, And I was intrigued. We use that cover in an exhibition on the history of Saratoga Springs because Saratoga Springs is a resort community. Um, but then I, I wanted to know more. So I started digging into the history of the Negro Motorist Screen Book. Um, and it, it really is a, you know, it, it's kind of a tough little guide because all it is is basically addresses and, and phone numbers, um, some display ads, and then there's usually one article in each each book. but but. No historian at that point had really written about the Green Book. And I wanted to uh, 
um, think more deeply about it. And the more I thought, I realized, gee, this story is not about the green book so much. It's about the automobile. And it's about the role that the automobile played in African-American life and how that role was different from the role the automobile played in white American life. And the, the thing that really um, dawned on me as I was working on this project uh, that I thought was about African-Americans in general was that this was my story. Um, you know, this was not just the story of African-Americans, but it was a very, very personal story about how my parents took us to North Carolina every summer um, in their automobile and how that journey, how that journey happened, how that journey took place. Um, and the way that they behaved, the not never stopping at a hotel, never stopping at a restaurant, carrying all their own food, bringing uh, pillows and, and blankets in the car was really the story of African-Americans in the automobile and segregation that I was not really fully aware of at the time. So that's, that's how the, the story just grew into a kind of a, a memoir as well as um, a story about African-American history and the automobile. You know, I certainly, it's so interesting to hear you say that. I certainly, in my experience as a filmmaker, I don't know, I haven't had another experience in which the experts and the scholars were also personal stakeholders in the material they were talking about so that all of you, but everyone, I mean, we have 25 people talking about this story and virtually every one of them um, is there as a, as a scholar, but also as someone whose experience this speaks to very, very directly. And in that sense, Craig, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, that as the story as Gretchen has described, it went from being this extraordinary thing, the green book, an expedient to get around conveniently and safely, or, you know, as Victor Green said, you know, travel without, travel and recreation without humiliation. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about how deep this story goes? I mean, that's one thing I really felt so struck by working with Gretchen and working with you and with, frankly, the whole cohort was how, how central and deep it becomes in anybody's understanding of the American experience? You know, I think that's that question sort of hits to the heart of so many things that actually sort of torment us in the United States, both, both in our past and in our present, and unfortunately in our near future. You know, I think we, we tend to have this idea, this, this um, romantic notion about technology, and some of it's based in reality. Right. The automobile, this extraordinary technology, does in fact bring a certain level of liberation to African Americans, a certain freedom um, that they didn't enjoy or that they enjoyed in other ways, um, restricted ways, before its advent. Um, but technology is always wrapped up in race and social reality. Technology amplifies the divisions um, and the, the cleavages of the society. And so one of the things that I feel really come to appreciate about the entire project is the way in which, as you point out, each of the historians who came to talk about this could never talk about it as simply um, a history of technology or even a kind of distant objective history of the United States. We were all personally implicated in it because that's how technology works, right? That's, that's what technology does for us. Um, and so really the roots of this actually go way back before the automobile was ever invented. You know, it goes back to the, um, the way in which the racial civilization of the United States always depended upon limiting freedom, denying freedom, denying liberty can't be achieved without actually denying mobility. One has right. to restrict mobility. And so, you know, right in New York City, um, if we go back to 1712, which you know, Rick, you've worked on this, I've worked on it, you know, that 1712 slave revolt in Manhattan. Before that revolt, there are extraordinary efforts to limit the mobility of enslaved Black people. Mm -hmm. That revolt happens, nine um, your white Christians are executed that night. And almost immediately, one of the aims of the local government, of the colonial government, is to further restrict the movement of Black people. Um, to make sure that they're actually not moving about um, without uh, unsurveilled and unknown. 
um, those efforts actually sweep through all of the surrounding colonies. So New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, all actually make, take different steps to further control, control and restrain the black population. So one of the things I, you know, I'm always taken to is the deep obsession that Americans have with the physical mobility of black people and how in fact that concern has shaped so much of American history and shaped so much of the technology of the way that we experience the technical and the technological in our society. You know, that's but from what from what <laughs> Craig and and Gretchen as well, it's so striking to me how this story, you know, the door you knock on is the green book, the Negro Motorist Guide. And you know, what we found was like, well, you know what, we called it driving while black because we wanted to be clear that this is a story of continuing contemporary urgent relevance. And then at the same time, the subtitle for the film became Race, Space, and Mobility in America. And just as you say, you know, I was really stunned to see how deeply embedded the idea of mobility and then also the unequal distribution of mobility within the space of America was. William Blackstone, English jurist from the 18th century whose commentaries on the law described he wanted to create a kind of physics of liberty. So it would be because you could actually see happening and didn't have a kind of like a, you know, an airy, uh, hard to grasp quality. He said, you know, freedom, liberty is locomotion. And those were ideas that were assembled by what we call the founding fathers and built into the founding documents that freedom meant mobility. In which case then with a revelatory, revelatory power for me that's painful, but really deeply illuminating. You go, wait a second, mobility as a simple fact has not been distributed equally. Literal mobility and figurative mobility, economic mobility, social mobility in every conceivable way. And in that respect, you know, Gretchen, I'm so struck by how the, this topic, your topic, revolutionizes our idea of what the word automobile means. And you can't, you can't really understand mobility unless you understand how mobility is denied to African Americans. Right. And we start to really see how space is also divided because mo that greater mobility gives people the opportunity to travel through space. People didn't travel very much um, before the automobile. People stayed put, they stayed in their communities, they stayed in their white spaces and their black spaces. But then we see the automobile opening up the country and people are traveling through white space to get from one safe black space to another safe black space. But that's very dangerous because as you're going through white space, people who are white view that as their space. Um, and, and what strikes me so much is Ahmed Aubrey, who was in what was perceived of as white space. Right. He was in white space and therefore people didn't want him in that space and he was murdered. So we're seeing that this is continuing into the 21st century. You know, the, can you give us a sense, Gretchen, of how extraordinarily liberating this self-locomoting device was specifically for African-Americans um, who had been liberated from a certain kind of shackle with emancipation and the Civil War and the, the Bill of Rights amendments afterwards, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, but then relocked into place when Reconstruction collapsed. And Jim Crow laws came out. Can you give us a sense? Um, chime in too as well, Craig, about, about how really kind of re-immobilized um, and how important to white populations it was to re-immobilize African-Americans in the late 19th century, in which context arose the automobile. Well, I, you know, I think we think about uh, public transportation as being a, a very positive thing. Um, there's, there's even an organization I, I spoke with this summer called the War on Cars that, um, you know, that supports public transportation. But for African-Americans, public transportation was humiliating. If you got, and, and it was dangerous. If you got on a bus, the bus drivers were surly and cruel. They carried guns, they shot people. They would 
allow you to get on, pay your money and tell you to get on the back door. And then when you got off to get on the back door, they would pull away. It was humiliating to be on um, the colored bus and sit in the back of the bus. The same thing was true of trains and trolley cars. So African-Americans found public transportation humiliating, dangerous, and absolutely not the way they wanted to raise their children. They didn't want their children to face that same kind of humiliation. So the automobile gives you this kind of private uh, space. It's like you're home away from home. You're enclosed in this space. Your children are safely ensconced in the back seat and you don't have to worry about that kind of, that kind of humiliation. However, there are other dangers along the road. In, the landscape. Yeah. You know, I wanted to sort of, go ahead. Craig. Yeah. Every, you know, every historical social revolution, every historical economic revolution and, and technical revolution has actually been followed by attempts to um, control the consequences of that revolution um, and to make sure that those revolutions don't actually alter or destabilize the racial civilization of the United States. And we can go back to you know, emancipation, you know, right in New York, you know, um, Elizabeth Jennings and the black women who just before the Civil War began fighting for fair access to public transportation. Um, you know, that's a, that's a 150, 170 year old fight um, in New York City. Um, and the movement of black people through space has always been, in fact, a destabilizing um, social reality. And, and much of our history is actually about, in fact, that fight over black people's physical mobility. You know, I, I'd like to sort of just, if we may, just jump forward to a wider and broader contemporary context before absolutely going back. Is one thing that seems to me really brought to light about this story, driving while black, African-Americans on the road during the era of Jim Crow at its heart, but really race, space, and mobility in America being its broad, what now, 400 plus year you know, theme and unfolding, is the degree to which, as you say, every step forward, political, social, technological, has also brought with it a response. And I've been very struck myself and wondering, Craig and Gretchen, um, your thoughts on this, but the way in which we can kind of see that when these really bursts of increased mobility when it comes to race, always hard one, but then always followed by, a re, by efforts to re-immobilize. And we've seen that actually quite recently. And I was wondering if you could just for our for our colleagues, for our friends here in the audience, sort of think in the big picture of American history as having been a series of episodes um, in which we've made progress, but then, you know, it was so easy to somehow think, especially for white people, ah, the civil rights revolution of the 1960s, that's behind us. And yet, Greg? Oh, I, I was gonna defer to Greg's <laughs> <laughs> Gretchen? I heard that question is perfect for Gretchen, actually. Uh, one step forward, two steps back. Um, you know, uh, throughout this, this research process, um, it's exactly as you were saying. It was um, every time African-Americans made any progress, there was a reactionary step to push them back. And I, you know, it, um, we see it, we see it now. Um, I would say the one that, that I think is most disheartening was to see President Obama actually convened a task force on policing that came up with absolutely wonderful um, suggestions. And, and, and these were suggestions made by police officers about how we can change policing in the United States. And it was, nothing became of it. It was swept under the rug by the next administration. And so here we are with the same kinds of things. We're still facing the same kinds of problems with law enforcement and nothing is being done. Um, there was this enormous reaction this past summer. Um, and immediately after George Floyd's death, there were other deaths that were not as publicly, uh, right. you know, that we didn't hear about as publicly but the same kind of thing was happening to Af African-Americans. So it's, it's, it's a very contemporary issue. It's, it's, it's right now. This driving while black is, is real and it's happening right now. 
you know, 2020 was really, last year, Craig has really been um, uh, a tra traumatizing and difficult one for the world. Um, and it's also had, you know, changed this story or rather revealed aspects of this story in certain ways. And, you know, with apologies for interrupting what you're about to say, say that and then if you could address your sense of, you know, which Gretchen is bringing up of the um, kind of continual sort of renewed relevance um, of this story um, to American culture and world culture. And Rick, you know, when you introduced us, you mentioned how long we've all known each other, which um, <laughs> is a, a side story to all of this. But in fact, actually, one of the things I was thinking about um, is when I came in to work with the two of you on this project, although I, you know, I've known Gretchen has been working on this for a long time. She's told me about it. Um, we've actually shared thoughts and ideas and conversations. Um, I knew that you were actually picking up the project. It wasn't until we actually started doing the interviews and we had the exchanges with the scholars that I realized that this project was reshaping the way I thought about American history. Mm. There were all of these things for decades, these documents that I've looked at, these records that I've looked at, where I never really thought about how important, how central the question of Black people's movement was yeah. to, the, to those historical moments and how one of the continuous threads of American history is both the attempt to restrain the mobility of Black people, which in fact actually confesses the deep fear that we have of Black people experiencing anything that even approaches true physical freedom and self-determination, um, but also the other part of that story, which is the as we go back in time, as we go back to the 17th century colonies and the 18th century and the establishment of the United States, the power that we assign to white people to police the movements of black people mm -hmm. and how central that has been to the American story. The idea that every white person can actually deputize him or herself to surveil and limit and confine Black people to spaces where we imagine they belong and to exclude them from spaces where we don't imagine they belong, where we, we're, we're quite confident that they don't belong. And so one of the things that this project has done for me is that it actually forced me to remember that American history is literally in motion. It's moving <laughs> all the time. And that there are these constant themes and threads that return. And that one of the reasons why the recent events around policing and, and um, black men and women in automobiles are so painful and unsettling is precisely that they remind us of the depth of that crisis in American history, how central it is to the American experience and how it actually exposes myths about what, we, what and who we think we are. Um, our celebration of the automobile and freedom is complicated by our, the racial realities of the United States in ways that we don't like to directly confront because they implicate us in very personal ways. You know, there's, there, there's the positive side of this story, um, you know, you know, takes place when, I mean, in the way that both of you are making so clear, so vivid, I think, um, the, the premium put on mobility and now the new modality of mobility that the automobile presented. Gretchen, you know, I was wondering if you could, you know, it's not just the car, it's also the automobile industry, it's also Detroit, it's also highways. I was wondering if you could like just give a sense a little bit of how, you know, in the opening two, three decades of the 20th century, the automobile both as an industry, as a form of getting about, really, really was a game changer um, in many ways for African Americans in terms of employment, et cetera. And then I'd also love it if you could, so I, I love to hear you think about this, Tell us why the Buick is so good. <laughs> I love that piece of it. You know, um, first of all, I, I should say that African Americans loved driving. There were, you know, there was a, a joy in driving despite the landscape that they faced, despite um, all of the dangers that they faced. They went out on the road all the time and they loved driving and they felt that, and my parents felt that driving was opening up the world in ways um, that it needed to be open, that, that they were encountering white people, that they were putting themselves out there 
so that white people could see that African Americans were middle class, knew how to behave, you know, were Americans and deserved to be able to see the country. So I will say that was a very courageous thing, I think, for uh, African Americans to do. And it was, you know, it, it was, I had a wonderful childhood, um, you know, with my parents taking us places in our, in our car. Um, but what I wanted to know about, uh, well, in the automobile industry, uh, the automobile industry provided opportunities for African Americans. Henry Ford was a raging anti-Semite, but he hired African Americans to work in the automobile industry. Now he didn't hire them um, for, the, for the, the least dangerous jobs. He hired them for the most dangerous jobs um, and the nastiest jobs, but they were still able to make money and making money helped them to move into the middle class. So the automobile industry did some very positive things for African-Americans. And as a result, some African-Americans did buy Fords because Ford allowed them to, to work in the factories um, as American Jews didn't buy Fords because Ford was a raging um, anti-Semite. Um, at the same time, African-Americans bought Buicks in huge numbers. And I was fascinated by the fact that race determined what kind of a car you would buy. Mm. And why would you buy a Buick? Well, a Buick was a, a high-end car. It was luxurious. It was comfortable. You could sleep in it if you needed to. It had a trunk that was huge. And you needed that big trunk, right? You might have to carry gasoline. You had to carry jugs of water. You had to carry a big, heavy Coleman cooler full of fried chicken and potato salad and because you couldn't stop at a restaurant. You had to carry pillows and blankets. You needed all of this stuff. So African-Americans were carrying their little hotel in their car just in case so that they could be safe and they could protect their families on the road. And you needed a car that was reliable. And a Buick was a reliable car and heavy and hard to turn over. So if you encountered an angry mob, it wasn't so easy for them to, to uh, turn over your car. And a Buick was the perfect car. And city after city, the, the largest number of African-Americans bought Buicks. Yeah, and Gretchen, as I've heard yeah. you say, you know, in the racial imagination of the United States, that story got turned into um, a rather a caricature of black people wanting yeah. big fancy cars with that erased, in fact, the social and political realities of how those choices were being shaped. Um, and that's so central to really understanding the, the power of the automobile in American history. You know, and to that, Craig, the, the, an aspect that's exhilarating to re reflect upon is the degree to which challenges and all, this, the world that the Green Book reflected and serviced and opened up, um, and it did that. It was like, it didn't just sort of reflect the world, it actually helped create more businesses. Talk a little bit about this incredible world of African-American um, entrepreneurship and businesses, um, you know, which Gretchen, you know so much about as well, right. but like, you know, the world right. created by the green, if you had your green book and you had your car, you were going to create not only a vacation for yourself, <laughs> an entire parallel American commercial culture. That, that choice multiplied, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times, if not millions of times. Um, then led to the creation of whole new business districts. Um, it reshaped black communities, South and North. Um, you know, one of the, I think, really important um, messages that one finds in the film um, is that this is not a Southern story. This is a United right. States story, right? It's a story about Vermont and Maine as much as it's a story about Alabama. Um, and it's certainly a story about California um, and the West Coast Black communities that form in the um, middle and the second half of the 20th century. Um, and so absolutely, I think one of the striking things that, um, that gets revealed is the way in which the automobile creates, in fact, all of these um, secondary economies. Um, you know, the, the, you know, I'm always going to get nervous talking about this if Gretchen is there, because <laughs> I'm going to be looking to make sure I got it right. Uh, you but, you know, <laughs> the beauty of, the beauty of um, Victor Green's Green Book 
which I had actually come across. I think I told Gretchen this story. I came across it in the Brooklyn Public Library as a teenager years and years and years ago. I, I remember just sitting there flipping through it and not really understanding what it was about at all um, until much later in my life. But part of the beauty of it is actually that it, it documents the economic transformations that happened in black communities across the United States. Um, and not just the um, ability of black families to make the decision to hit the road and to actually travel, but the consequence of that, which meant was that a whole service industry emerged um, to respond to those black travelers on the roads. Um, and it's easy now to forget from the 21st century how dynamic that economy was, how dynamic those communities were. Um, but in fact, it shows up over and over again in American history, we see glimpses of it, including in, you know, when we look at both in, in documentary and in, um, and in sort of narrative history, the story of the civil rights movement. You know, they, were, they were meeting in the very cafes that formed to serve black drivers. They were living in the very hotels and motels um, that black families and the boarding houses that black families actually helped put together and, and build to serve um, black travelers. And so it's actually a remarkable story of um, the way in which the, the economic choices and personal and family choices of black families really did transform the 20th century. Um, in ways that we continue to wrestle with today. You know, Gretchen, you, you've, you've thought so deeply about this point that, that Craig is making, that, you know, that the, the, the civil rights movement in the 20th century, you know, kind of like coming out of the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and crescendoing in the 50s and 60s, that's the period of the Green Book. That's the period of the automobile. And I remember the first time you told me, said to me, no automobile, no civil rights movement. Right, you couldn't have the civil rights movement without the automobile. Think about the Montgomery bus boycott. In order to boycott the buses, to desegregate the buses, they bought a fleet of automobiles that they used to drive people to work. There was no other way for people to get to work except those buses. But with that fleet of automobiles, they could get people to work, they could, they could get rid of um, the buses and that made it possible to bankrupt the bus company. The same thing is true of, uh, of registering voters. If you had to register voters in a county, you couldn't do that by walking door to door. You had to have a car to go around that county and, and register those voters. And, the, and if you were Medgar Evers and your job as the NAACP field secretary was to go out and, and check on lynchings and, and church burnings and other atrocities that are happen happening to black people, you had to have a car. You couldn't do any of those things by walking. Um, and there was no other way for you, to, for you to get around. But I think the one, that, the one that really surprised me that I didn't know about was this idea of flying in to a Southern city for a civil rights um, action and being stuck at the airport because only white cabs picked up people at the airports. There was no way for you to get out of the airport and get to your hotel, a black hotel, of course, unless you could rent a car. And that's what they did. They rented cars. So the car becomes absolutely a crucial tool in the civil rights movement that we had just not thought of before. How important it was um, to, in everything that was done in the civil rights movement. You know, the um, Green Book first one was 1936. I think if I remember, first of the first Negro Motorist Guide, it was one of many. Um, it was the longest lived and the most well known, and the most partly because Standard Oil kind of went into business with them and said, "Well, you know, we will help you distribute this." But then it came to an end. And it's interesting how, in connection with what you're saying about the civil rights movement, that with the legislation that made it no longer legally possible to uh, discriminate housing. Um, the, uh, hotels where you could eat. Very shortly after that revolution, legislative revolution, the last Green Book, 1966, you know, was went to press and went out of business. And I was wondering if you could both reflect for us a little bit about. There's so many issues that brings up. One is the the ephemeralness and the fragility of the historiography of this incredibly intimate, homely little guide. 
you know, not meant to last, meant to be republished each year, and then goes out of business, and indeed the businesses themselves, which not long after the civil rights movements, this flourishing parallel culture began to hit its own hard times precisely because of the civil rights. Um, but there's a, there's a parallel movement as part of civil rights, and that is that the NAACP and the Urban League are filing lawsuits. So there's legal action going on at the same time that there's direct action. And th that legal action was designed to break open the national chains. Uh, Hilton, right. Howard Johnson's, Sheridan, all the national chains. And so in 1964, when the Civil Rights Act is passed and public accommodations open up, African-Americans can now go to stay at Howard Johnson's. They can now stay at Sheridan and they do because part of the civil rights movement was also about that breaking open those national chains. So this causes a decrease in the number of people who are staying at these black owned um, smaller businesses that have flourished all over the country, um, but now gain no white support. Um, you know, and, and Johnson, who's the head of Ebony Magazine, he says, it's not that African, that so many African Americans stopped going to these places. It's that they never were able to get any white support going there. So when a small number of African Americans decreased their usership of these places, they just couldn't pick up enough. They, they couldn't pick up a white audience at all. It's really one for me, one very, 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 go ahead, Craig. Well, I was just going to say, you know, uh, parallel to that, there's um, really, in fact, in the years of the Green Book, um, you have a rather heightened and focused NAACP Legal Defense Fund attempt to desegregate Southern transportation, um, which is, you know, such an important part of this story because it was focused on, in fact, desegregating those bus terminals. It was focused on um, desegregate or allowing, in fact, Black passengers to travel freely. Um, when it actually succeeds largely by the 1950s, um, it actually has its own you know, sort of um, immediate consequences on the political economy of the South. Right. You know, I, with, before, we, before we, it gets opened up in a few minutes to questions, I just wanted to ask you both in a sense a version of the same question, which is, okay, so it's been 50 years, you know, you know 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, and teens, since the, the heyday of the American 20th century civil rights movement. And yet the thing that was so striking to me, talking with all of you um, and feeling through American history and American contemporary reality over the last 50 years, is indeed how much things have changed and how much things happen. And Craig, I was wondering if you could give a sense a little bit, because I think that as a person who's not African-American, it's hard until you get a grasp of some of the things that I've learned from, from you and Gretchen and your colleagues. Understand how much, the, you know, in the, we use phrases like systemic racism. Actually, it's an ex, not an abstract reality. It's a concrete reality that happens every time a black parent watches their teenage, usually son, but their teenage child get into a car and wonders, will they be safe? I was wondering, Craig, if you could-, could um, Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, a, it, it's, it's racial, but it's also generational. I think we understand it a, a differently across generations. You know, my, my mother um, you know, wanted me to get a driver's license when I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn, um, a teenager growing up in Brooklyn. And it seemed almost as important to her as my graduating from college. Mm. You know, as I was, as I was <laughs> successfully navigating college, she kept actually reminding me that I didn't have a driver's license yet. Um, and I, I really didn't understand, you know, that, that theme in our conversations um, until much later when I realized that for her generation, the driver's license and the automobile actually changed one's life circumstances. Um, her whole world changed because of the automobile. She grew up in Brooklyn too. Um, and you know, she grew up in Brooklyn at a, at a moment when black Southerners from places like North Carolina and South Carolina, Virginia were swarming into New York City when the black West Indian community was emerging in New York City. Um, and much of that, and their livelihoods often depended upon their relationship to automobiles. 
um, you know, the, the economic choices that they had in this sort of constrained and fixed economy. And so, you know, I, I think for African-Americans, you know, we, we certainly can talk about the way in which that technology transformed their worlds. The other reality is that, uh, is the reality of danger. And we've talked about it in lots of different ways when Gretchen was talking about the civil rights movement being impossible without the automobile. Um, one of the things I was thinking, I, I just couldn't shake from my mind was the counter revolution of white supremacy during the civil rights era that attempts to stop in fact, the black freedom struggle and to silence black people's demand for equality often focused on the mobility of black people and civil rights workers during that period, right? Um, uh, you know, um, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner, um, the murder of, of um, the civil rights workers in June, 1964, you know, is an automobile story. It's a, it's a story, in fact, that, that sits right at the center of this complex Evers. relationship that we have. Sorry, go ahead. Well, uh, Medgar Evers was also shot next to his car. Viola Liuzzo was shot in her car. Yes, it's... The, the counter-revolution of white supremacy actually focused on the technology of the automobile and the mobility of black folks and civil rights workers um, as, as, but as a strength of the civil rights movement that needed to be thwarted, um, that needed to be stopped. Um, and it reminds me of you know, the way in which I grew up um, you know, here in Brooklyn, both with a mother who desperately wanted me to have the opportunity to drive because driving actually represented to her. Um, it, it, it opened up a set of choices and possibilities um, that I no longer thought of, I didn't think about in the same way, but also who was terribly afraid for my safety once I was in an automobile because it took me so far beyond any place where she could protect me. Um, and I think for African-Americans, you know, we, we've had this conversation. One of the things that struck me when the historians were gathering to talk about this project was that all of us had some version. You know, every black scholar there, man and woman, had some version of an automobile story involving danger um, and involving fear. And you know, so this is a revolutionary technology. It's a, 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 an extraordinary story. But it's also particularly, I think, poignant precisely because it opens up a narrative of both opportunity and fear. Yeah, um, now let, let's have Louise Mir join us again. If you could, I could go on listening to you both forever. And I know that there are gonna be questions from the audience. So Louise, if you could you could join us and maybe we, maybe Craig and, oh. and you're a Thanks, bit Rick. And, um, first, first of all, let me thank uh, all three of you. This has been a truly riveting um, conversation and uh, certainly reminds us that this past, among many others, are not really the past at all. Um, we have some great questions from the audience, and I'm going to go right to the first one, which is how did the creation of the in, sorry, interstate highway system impact the issue of Black mobility? Well, like one, of, one of the things that um, I, I think is important to think about is how the, the highways facilitated African-Americans uh, travel because African-Americans didn't want to go through these little towns. You didn't know how you would be, um, how people would respond to you if you went through every little town. So African-Americans wanted to stay on the highways. The problem was in building the highways, many of them were put right through black neighborhoods and they destroyed the very businesses that sprang up to support African-American travelers. So there's a paradox there. You know, highways are good because you don't have to drive through little towns, but highways destroyed black neighborhoods. I um, grew up in, in Newark, New Jersey and my parents moved to the suburbs um, you know, when I was 13. And several years ago, I took my daughter to, we went to the Newark Museum. And at the end of the day, I said, let me take you to see the house where I grew up. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it because Newark is now bisected by a highway and there were no landmarks. I couldn't find any of the landmarks that I remembered when I was a kid. Um, and, and so, you know, when I, when I talk to folks about their hometown, they'll say, oh, well, yeah, that city 
you know, Highway 264, Highway 80. I spoke last week in, um, in Rye, New York, and in the Black neighborhood and the Black Cemetery were destroyed um, by Interstate 80. You know, so every, every community has a story about urban renewal, also known as Negro removal. Um, and so many Black businesses were destroyed. That is the systemic part of, you know, of, of racism. You know, when you see that two steps forward, but then, you know, three steps back. Um, I mean, it's, I just want to just jump in and say astonishing. I mean, it was just go around the country as we had to, because this is a national story. And from New York City to Newark to, you know, where Interstate 10 went through the Treme section of New Orleans to, you know, uh, downtown Los Angeles again and again and again, you see the lack of political power to keep the road from being built in the place, place, places where you live, the sort of NIMBY, you know, was not a, a political option for most African-Americans. And so it was in your backyard. And to see that this re reality you're describing, how absolutely universal it is as an example of the systemic racism you're talking about. Well, that was, um, I think, a really great question and great, great answers there. Um, this, this question is for you, Craig. Um, uh, so the, the car is one icon of the American experience, um, experienced differently by Black Americans. Um, are there some others that um, you've been thinking about that um, deserve discussion? I'm just really a question should be for all three of you, but I'll start with you, Craig. Yes, um, it'll take us off topic a bit, but, I, <laughs> but you know, I, I think there are lots of um, the, the sacred symbols of the United States and the automobile is one. It's one of those symbols that we use to define a whole era of the history of the United States. Those sacred symbols all need to be re-examined um, because they're all rooted in both realities and in myth. And they're also rooted in um, deeply racialized and classed and gendered stories that we tell ourselves um, about how we relate to each other and how we relate to things like technology. And so. You know, I actually think the automobile, one of the great things about the automobile as a sort of um, historical topic is that you can actually really come to understand the gendering of society by looking at the automobile. Um, you can understand the gendering of African-American communities by looking at the automobile. Um, you can understand race in profound and poignant ways by looking at the automobile. But I think the, there are other institutions, there are other symbols in our society that have that same possibility of opening up really new ways of thinking about who we are as a people and how we got where we are. That's great. Do, um, Rick, you want to add anything? You know, I just, it's as always, it's um, extraordinary to sort of kind of reflect as, as these two people reflect um, on this reality. And I think that what's, what I just want to say, what I find, um, you know, liberating myself as a person in considering this history is how much real, if harsh and difficult light it sheds on something which is so central to an experience, which is absolutely shared. So, I mean, you know, I'm so grateful to Gretchen for coming to me. I'm not African-American. Coming to me to do this story with her um, and to have assembled as she did this remarkable cohort of people to think think it through through it with us, and you know, the the, the the exhilaration comes from seeing and you know everything that Gretchen you've said tonight and everything you have said, including just now, Craig, sort of Shandalana, is how much of this shared experience gets revealed by this kind of historical analysis, and it's a historical, as you're saying, Louise, it's past but it's present. <laughs> And it ha the degree to which it kind of opens up realities and forces us to be honest with ourselves and the world around us in a way which is, I mean, it's the car after all. Everybody's got a car or knows somebody who has a car. It's the most universal, intimate American experience. And then to discover inscribed so deeply in it, history and now, um, all these complex social, racial, political realities is um, to know that is to know how to think and to feel and to act in a way that's different if you don't. And uh, I think the film 
you know, makes those points beautifully. So thank you for that as well. Um, so Gretchen, there's a question about whether the automobile industry restricted dealership ownership to whites. Was, um, was there discrimination there as well on the, uh, yeah. on the sales end? Uh -huh. um, you don't start to see, uh, you see the first uh, automobile dealership in the late 50s in Detroit. Um, and there were, it, it, was, it was difficult, but you do start to see after the 50s, you do start to see African-Americans being able to buy um, a franchise. Um, and that was good. Cadillac perhaps restricted it a little longer than some of the other um, dealerships because they had this concern about African-Americans buying um, their automobiles, but um, they opened up as well. And in the 1970s, it's not until the 70s, we start seeing African-Americans in car advertisements in a positive way. They appear in, in car advertisements uh, as servants um, before the 1970s, but it's in the 1970s that we actually see African-Americans as drivers, as owners of automobiles in advertisements. That's, that's really late. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, we're, we're getting uh, towards the end of our time, but um, there, there are just a number of questions that all want to raise the same point. So I'm going to digest it and ask you if you can quickly respond. And that is, we've been so through so much pandemic above all. Um, is there any hope that the catastrophes that we've been, been through, and there have been too many of them to narrate here um, over, over the past year, um, will have any positive outcome bringing people together? What are, what are your thoughts? I'm gonna just jump in and say, you know, there's a line from Shakespeare's Troilets and Cressida, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. And I thought about that when a bat died in Wuhan and suddenly the entire world became infected um, with uh, the, the coronavirus. And I think that that shared experience, which has been so difficult, the positive side of this is massive increase in empathy because we're all in the same boat. And this ability to think and feel outside your own uh, experience when you now share something so universally. And I've taken enormous, I take enormous hope from that. And I do think that is part of the reason why George Floyd, you know, murdered last May hit and with more staying power um, than so many other, other of these um, horrifying incidents. Right. You know, I, I have a lot of people that have asked me, um, you know, why did you work with the white guy? Um, and mm -hmm. I did know that, that Rick was not African-American. Um, found that out, well, you know, halfway into the photo, into the movie, but I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I, I think African-Americans are only 13% of the population of the United States. Um, and I think it's really important that we find um, allies and collaborators. And I feel very fortunate to have found an ally and a collaborator in this project with me. Um, and I think that as I've talked about this film and I talked about the book, um, people have responded saying, I didn't know. Um, and I, you know, for me, that's the most hopeful thing that people are, are saying, I didn't know, I would like to do something. So I, I hope that this film um, and the book are, are both calls to action for people. Um, and, and what we saw last summer was, was very hopeful. Craig, what you, are you hopeful, Craig? I am, but I'll just say very quickly, I think the power of um, the, the real contribution of the book and the film, um, is that they capture the power of history. And the power of history is that it demystifies the present. And that's what I'm hopeful about. Um, we look to the past, not really actually to understand the past all that much better. We, what, its real power is that it de demystifies the present. It, it actually changes the way we think about our current reality. And that leaves me hopeful. Well, that is beautifully spoken and uh, obviously right up our alley at New York Historical. And we do hope that this evening's conversation will help people to see the past as a, as a way of informing their present and making them think more deeply about it. And judging from the questions, many of which we didn't get to, uh, I think that has happened this evening. So I thank all three of you 
uh, really truly for, um, for just a wonderful conversation and uh, very thought provoking and, um, and informative as well. So thank you and thanks to the audience for um, being so smart and engaged. And uh, we, we hope to see all three of you on our real stage sometime in the very near future. So thanks and good evening to everyone. Thank you, Louise. Thanks for having us. Thank you all.